Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm delighted. I'm Kirk Mackey, and I'm delighted to introduce three friends here to, who are full of wisdom and uh, wonderful information. So we're going to have a great afternoon discussing uh, this whole issue of church governance and how important that is for healthy churches. So first, I want to introduce uh, Jim Powell, who's been a pastor for 32 years and the author of an excellent book that I just finished called Dirt Matters. Jim, thank you for that. It's very helpful. Thank you. And, uh, he's currently the uh, pastor at Palm West in Phoenix, Arizona. Larry Onan is with us, and I've known Larry for a number of years. He's been the board chair for 17 years in a local church. He's an author. He's also one of our governance coaches for Transformation Ministries, and he helps churches that want to change from an outdated, and I would even say toxic managing board, to a healthy mission-focused governance board. That's what we're aiming for today. So Larry, welcome to you. And Ray Bennett, also a good friend Thanks, for many years. He's one of our lay leaders. He's kind of all over TM, the Energizer Bunny, we call him affectionately. He's a church health specialist. He's been a former business executive with Ford Motor Company and other places. So gentlemen, welcome to each of you. And thanks for uh, participating with us. So I'm just going to uh, encourage those who are watching that there's a Q&A feature. And feel free, if you hear something you want us to explore more, if you type in those questions for us, and we'll manage those as we go along. So as we begin, I just want to say I'm going to ask you guys some questions, and those can um, others can interact uh, through the uh, questions as we go. So just to open it up, gentlemen, why is a healthy governing board important to a church thriving today? What is the relationship between church health and the board and its governance process? I'll throw it to all three of you guys. I heard an illustration a couple of weeks ago that uh, commented that a church really is built around three ideas. One is the cause, one is the corporate, and one is the community, how you do the outreach. Mm. And a lot of times we don't realize how important the corporate is to the ability for the cause to go forward and the community to go forward. In mm. fact, we almost give it as a footnote of not being important at all. And I think the governance either makes or breaks your ability for a church to grow. So I think it's mm. extremely important and many times overlooked. So I'm all for this subject. That's why I get into it. <laughs> Hey, very good. Thanks, Larry. Jim or Ray, what do you guys think? Well, I would say from a pastoral perspective, you know, it's it sort of reminds me of the story when when uh, David was going to go against Goliath, right? And they said, well, you've got to, you know, they try to put him in Saul's armor. And David's like, I, I can't fight like this. This is not who I am. And I, I think when you don't have good continuity and you don't have a healthy model to where the pastor and the board work together, you're trying to do ministry and your heart's in the right place. And you may even know what God's asking you to do, but it's so cumbersome. It's so draining. You're just not free to be uh, the kind of church God wants you to be, the kind of pastor God wants you to be, and even the kind of board. It's very constricting and it's exhausting, to be honest, emotionally and spiritually. I've experienced in uh, being a very busy person myself uh, over many things that uh, Sometimes we don't appreciate the fact that uh, board members give up their private time, their personal time to be on the governance board. And they like to think and like to believe that uh, their time is well spent. They also like to believe that their contributions are well received. So I uh, personally like to have a board be cohesive, socially involved with each other so they know each other outside of the church and that they know that they're appreciated with their contributions. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Yeah, very good. So let's jump in and talk about, you know, what kind of boards are there out there today that you've experienced? And Jim, as a seasoned leader uh, over many years, what have you seen and, and how do those things work or not work? As far as uh, just church boards in general or different styles of church boards? Uh, all of the above, whatever you want to jump into. We'd <laughs> love to hear it. <laughs> yes, My yes. Yeah. So my experience is that uh, almost every church I've encountered uh, falls under what I what I consider five five kinds or five types of church boards. Uh, the first is what I call rubber stamp boards, and a rubber stamp board uh, usually occurs in smaller churches where you have a um, an individual person or a family that that holds the power of that congregation. And so you have a board in place, but generally that one person or that one family sort of controls the decisions and everybody else falls in line. And so when you have um, a rubber stamp board where basically one or two people sort of control the church, 
uh, you have um, uh, a very passive board. They're just not very, they, they listen, they nod their head, but they always turn their head to the end of the table and it's either you know, John Doe or John Doe's family that's gonna make the, the decisions. In some cases, it can be a pastor too, where he controls the church and the board falls in line. The second kind of church board is often, uh, I see in large churches or, or mega churches, and that's what I refer to as an advisory board. And here, the pastor tends to load the board up with very competent people, but they are merely advisory. And so he'll share ideas and things like this. And in this model, the board is very what I call impotent. It's a strong word, but they really don't have any power to do anything. They're just giving the pastor ideas. He's using them as a sounding board. And unfortunately, you do have some large churches that the church board that should be the spiritual leadership of the church really are nothing more than an advisory board. Uh, the third most common style of board I see, uh, especially in smaller and medium-sized churches, is uh, what I call a management board. This can be in the form of a diaconate, or it can be in the form of an eldership, um, or just a church board. And a management board, though, the, the, the board sees themselves as the permission-giving organization. So you have to go and get their permission to do something. Um, and I think that both, uh, you know, Larry and Ray are going to be able to share some stories about how they've encountered this. Uh, but, but everything has to go through the board, especially for pastors that have a lot of initiative, a lot of drive, have a leadership gift. This is very, very hard because you have all these ideas. People look to you as the pastor for ideas and vision and direction. And yet you have to stop what you're doing and you have to ask permission. And in some of these churches, they meet once a month. So now I've got to wait three weeks to my next board meeting. And we can't make a decision in one month, so now it takes two months, and you're always losing momentum. Um, and so management boards or permission-giving boards are where the board sees themselves. Their responsibility is we've got to vote on things. We've got to give permission. Um, I remember um, in one of my churches, we I came into a church that had this kind of model. And I remember one year we were going through our budget, and we spent, and I'm not exaggerating, over 30 minutes debating over whether we could spend $200 on and the youth group on t-shirts, yep. you know, because they started line item in the budget and just like everything in the men that were like questioning this had no idea what was happening in the youth ministry, but they felt it was their job to, you know, make these decisions. And so um, a permission giving board management board um, is where a lot of American boards fall into. And the reason is because we are more influenced by American democracy than we really are the scriptures when it comes to our leadership. Mm. And mm. so we have to have checks and balances. So the board has to be able to approve everything. Also in this kind of a model, the pastor is often seen as nothing more than a hired hand, right? Yep. So your wow. job is simply preach and teach, do your job, and we'll make the decisions. The third kind of board, um, or the fourth kind of board, it generally occurs when a congregation starts to grow and they realize this management model is constricting and limiting. Um, not all churches see that. A lot of churches have a revolving door. They have a glass ceiling. They can't break, but they refuse to acknowledge the board may be part of the limiting factor. Uh, but when some churches do realize maybe we're being too controlling or too restricting, they then transition into what Larry Osborne calls a review board. And a review board is where the board begins to release a little bit of control. They start to say, you know what, uh, Kirk, we, we trust you. Go ahead and lead and, you know, work with the youth ministry and work with the worship ministry. We're going to give you a little more leash, right? And mm -hmm. so now the pastor and the staff feels a little bit more empowered to make decisions without asking permission. But then the board meetings uh, sort of evolve into this idea. You show up and now you face a Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> and so every board meeting is let's review every complaint that I heard the last four weeks, everything that didn't go well or everything I have a question about, we're going to go back and revisit that. And my analogy for myself, when we went through this, um, this uh, model of board, when we began to evolve is I felt like I would take off running and I was constantly getting grabbed by the collar and jerk backwards. You know, we'd get momentum and the board says, we trust you, Jim, go, you know, we'd start to make some momentum. And then I'd go to a board meeting. And next thing you know, I've got these 10 questions about why, why this happened and why'd you do that and how this happened, you know, and now I'm just being crushed because I'm being, I feel like I'm being micromanaged and second guessed. Now, the important thing I want to share about this, and then we're going to take some questions in these five models is that when I was in the review board mentality in both of my churches and also in the management board mentality, 
my board members, for the most part, had very good motives. They were not trying to micromanage. They were not trying to hurt the church. They just felt that that's what they were doing. They were just trying to be accountable. But we were we were butting heads. I wasn't free. They weren't free. They felt like they were not doing their job very well. And so all that led me, by God's grace, to be exposed to what we're going to talk about today, which is the accountable leadership model, also called the, the uh, church governance or vision model. Uh, and here is what we're going to be talking about today, which is where you begin to get a model of empowerment that I think is much more biblical, um, where you have your board focusing on vision and direction. They put together boundaries. They put together policies. And, um, and then within those policies and boundaries and direction, the, the, the staff and the lay leaders have some flexibility to move. And, um, and that's really the healthiest model, I think, is the most biblical model, and it's what we're going to step in today. So those are the five basic models that I see in churches, a rubber stamp board, a, um, um, a uh, advisory board, uh, a management board, a, a review board, and then the vision governance or ALM model of a board. So if people have some questions, I can take some questions, and then we can just uh, move on. Well, that's really helpful, James. And I listen to you share, I just realize how much I've experienced many of those and some of the frustration that goes with it. And uh, glad to say I've experienced the last one as well, which is really great. So yeah, there are questions, or you know what, Larry and Ray also, you guys can weigh in too on this as others are thinking about any questions. We'll just bounce yeah, that around again a little bit. I'll, I'll share some experience working with the management model that was just talked about. <clears throat> I grew up in the AVC uh, church uh, organization and uh, thought that was the only way. But um, the problem with the uh, management model is that although you may have some people uh, on the boards that you know feel that they're doing the right thing, they tend to come and vote on something and leave and assume that somebody is going to do the job. Whatever they, they passed, somebody else was going to do the job. I Before I went to seminary and became a pastor myself, uh, I experienced with one pastor that we had at a church that I had to go as the, I was the, uh, let's call it the senior lay leader of the church, the head of the executive council. I had to go with the pastor to every one of those board meetings. Mm. He feared the individual board chairs so much that he had to have me with me to kind of, let's say, soften the mm -hmm. questions that kept coming at him. Because when they had voted on something, you know, who did he get left with? He get left with the pastor and his staff to somehow get it done. I, I think the point, Jim, you made about the, the, there's people are not necessarily bad people out there that are on boards, but they don't really know what they're doing. Right. Yes. They are working in an area that's out of their frame of reference unless they serve on a nonprofit board and they're into nonprofit management. They come on a board and they're well-meaning and intentioning to do the right thing, but they are just tripping over themselves. And the pastor is caught in the middle of all that because they have never defined who they are as a board. Yes. So uh, I can see all, all four of those can be just chaos for the average person out there. Uh, one pastor told me, or he told a group of people in the middle of a conversation one time, I'm exhausted from trying to figure out who I report to here at this church. Yes. Yes. Because uh, everybody felt like he reported to them on their piece of the action. Yes. So it, it's a, uh, and there was nobody bad there. This right. was not an evil place. <laughs> well, was, and you'll also find within certain boards, sometimes you have different board members that have different mentalities. You, you have a couple of board members that maybe have been in a business function or been on a school board and they sort of understand, you know, more about empowerment. And you have a couple more that sort of been raised. All I've known is a management mentality, um, and uh, you're exactly right. So people go off their default. If you don't define it and you don't direct, if you don't define and you don't direct your board, everyone goes to their default and their default is generally what they feel most comfortable with or the only thing they've known. I had the same thing. I, I sat down with my board one time. I said, guys, I don't know who I report to. I don't, and I mean, we were doing budgets one year and I, this is a true story. I had three different board members. One was a construction manager, ran a large company, said, Jim, do the budget. And just build in like a 5% contingency. So if things, our church was growing, you know, over 20%, he said, just put a contingency so we have some margin. 
The yeah. second guy was our finance guy. And he's like, well, don't worry about that. He goes, just do the budget and we can amend the budget during the year as we go through the year. The third guy was a guy that had a Silicon Valley background, very detail oriented. He goes, he said, are you kidding me? He goes, uh, he said, contingency budgets, all they do is reward bad budgeting, right? And I mean, he gave it to me. I said, guys, I don't care. Just tell me what you want me to do. But three of you told me to do three different budgets, right? That's what happens if you don't define and you don't direct. <clears throat> yeah, I think in our whole conversation here as to how do you get a healthy board that does the right thing and you can enjoy the, I think people want to enjoy what they do in church. Mm -hmm. And the board needs to enjoy the board process. And if they're not knowing, if they don't know what governance is, they're going to be floundering all over the place by default. Mm -hmm. wow. I just met with a brand new board for one church uh, here in LA. And I've been coaching the pastor. And as I met with the board, there were several people that had never been on a board in their life. Mm -hmm. So we had to talk a little bit about what their assignments are what their ministries are, what their contribution to the church is going to be. Oftentimes we recruit people onto boards and never take five minutes even to tell them what yes. the position means. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a good word. Good. Well, thank you for introducing that. So, you know, five different ways board or four different ways boards can go sideways, so to speak. And then we're arguing for a, a healthy model. I want to transition us for a moment here into this idea about, you know, about where in the scriptures are even this idea of boards utilized? I mean, is this a biblical idea or is this just purely something that's come out of management in the last hundred years or so? So I know, Ray, you've got some thoughts and done some research on that. Uh, let us know what you've come up with. Yeah, there's a, I'm just going to hold this up for all, everybody who's uh, watching. This is called a council and it's a, uh, it's a uh, author is Gary Hoke. Uh, with an associate, Wesley Kilmer and Gregory Henson. It, tra it traces through four different boards over the years and it, and it talks about the first board being a board set up by the God himself. And it happened as the Egyptians uh, uh, had released the Jews uh, rather unwillingly, but they did release them after 400 years of captivity. And, but they were, they were so used to being uh, at, at one location with uh, their daily programs that they could not handle themselves well in the desert. And so they complained all the time. And Moses was their leader. And uh, he, he spoke frequently with God, telling God that, uh, how can I handle all these complaints? And their latest complaint was they were tired. Now, after they've been fed every day, they've been tired of the manna and they wanted meat. So there was a, a big thing going on about, we want, we want meat. And God tells him, we'll give you meat until you really don't want any more meat. But anyway, he tells Moses to have them gather at the tent of the, they call it the tent meeting place. Uh, and I will come to them and I will speak to them and I will impart upon them some of the uh, power that has been given to you so that they may lead, but choose from those, choose the, from the masses, the large group, choose 70. And they have to be uh, wise. They have to be a uh, counselor type. They have to be leaders and elders. And then we will put them in charge of the, the lower level problems and you take care of the more serious. But I will impart that upon them. But he had a unique requirement. He said, have them come and stand. Hmm. Now, someone could say, well, that's because the tent wasn't all that big. They didn't have chairs, et cetera, et cetera. No, that's not the reason. He wanted them to stand and listen because he was going to talk to them. God himself was going to talk to them and empower them. Hmm. So that's called the, the Moses first council created by God himself with 70 of them. And then, and then it goes through, and there's, a, there's another council, and uh, it's, it's a council that, uh, well, let me just tell you my takeaways on that. The 70 had to be seasoned elders of them. They had to stand and listen to God with Moses, not talking, not listening, uh, but listening, but not lounging in a comfortable cushion, standing in obedience and uh, in servitude to God, spiritual maturity and administrative gifting. Those were the requirements that he had to choose from. 
The Jewish council, which happened uh, in, the, in the first century, about a thousand years later, uh, they still had uh, 70 members, but guess what? They were called the Sanhedrin and they had a high priest just as Moses was a high priest. But uh, they shifted in their process from being a stand and listen and obedient governance model to one of uh, sitting, chatting and ruling. And um, so it was, uh, they, they also did not choose the kind of people that God told Moses to choose from the first 70. They choose the more educated people of wealth and authority whose principal goal was to preserve Jewish rules and traditions. Mm -hmm. Words like chief priest, they all had positions. So they were ruling and creating rules and laws to control the people to keep peace with Rome. The focus was on money. So you see how that shifted from being spiritually led by God and, and power imported by the Holy Spirit on them to being sitting around and we're going to make up some rules. We've got to control these people. We've got to keep our, keep our position so the Rome doesn't clean us out. Another one was a little bit later on. Uh, the third one, the Gentile councils of the Roman world. And, and during that time, it was made up of trusted local officials, governing communities, and they had various levels for the various sized communities. It was under Greek rule, it was in the Mediterranean period for its centuries. It was a subset of a larger group known as the assembly. And that commissioned the councils with authority to govern with each, within each one of the cities. Again, what they did though, is they hired, or I, said, I should say appointed people uh, with authority and generally well-educated. And uh, that system uh, contained wealthy people and the priests were, who were highly motivated, again, to preserve the status quo. Takeaway, focusing on money, power, and control led by wealthy people who remained in control for long periods of time and became prideful. Doesn't sound like the first 70 at all, does it? Now, the last one is the Jewish Council and the Acts of Apostles. The Jerusalem Council is, a, is a, a brief name for it. And they were leaders of the Christ followers. Now, if you remember, Christ created a whole new paradigm when he said the Gentiles are covered by the gospel as well. The Jews had to deal with this issue if they were now going to take in non-Jews and somehow keep the Jews that had followed the law as best they could for centuries, now we've got to take in these outsiders. And how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is we, we have to get them uh, uh, so that they are, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, that, so that the men are taken care of, okay? <laughs> I'll say it that way. And uh, so they had to settle the argument. So what they did is they appointed a few people and they went out and they talked about it in detail. The, the group was larger. It was an open conversation. It was more, how do we handle this whole thing about circumcision? Uh, and should we or should we not? Well, the hardline Jews that were now Christ followers said, yeah, they, they've got to adhere to it. We've adhered to that since Moses time. But Peter stands up just as he did in the day of Pentecost. He stands up and he closes off the argument with these words. He said, hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. He accepted, meaning God, accepted giving them the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them. He purified their hearts by faith. We believe that it is through the grace of God of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So Peter brings it right down and says, they're no different than we are. Mm. So then the logical conclusion to that argument is, so why would we encumber them with the yoke of circumcision? Because it's been difficult for us to follow that all along. And so what they did is they came up with a, an effective compromise that basically said that they were not to uh, they were not to do uh, immor immor immorality amongst them. Uh, they were not to eat of the cloven. They were not to uh, drink 
raw blood or have raw blood. So those were the only, let's say, Jewish things that they pulled out and said, abide by this and bless you, you are now one of us. And so that's how Peter settled it. They went back to James at the head church in Jerusalem and it became the new requirement. So they did this all in prayer. They did it openly. It wasn't in secret as a Sanhedrin often did as they did with Christ. It was brought out in the open. It was discussed. It was mutually agreed to and that settled it. That was absolutely critical to the growth of what we now call Christianity. I think a lot of times we don't realize that that there was actually boards constructed throughout the Bible to accomplish certain kinds of objectives and some good and some bad. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would add about your story <laughs> in Acts 15 is that the, the other important thing here is, is it was put in writing. Yes. A lot of times churches, especially small churches, are vo verbal cultures. We talk about things, then we forget about what we talked about. But here they're establishing the boundaries. They're establishing the expectations in writing. And if you look, that same phrase is repeated twice in that chapter. It's the, what they put down, the, the, the summary is given to the people because it's, it's clarified what, what's given to the people about, we do not want to make it difficult for the Gentiles to convert. So you have the why, you have clarification on the boundaries. And that's part of the vision model is, uh, is uh, you know, Larry's going to share more about is it's defining the expectations, the boundaries. And within the boundaries, there's freedom for the church to be able to, to do ministry, whether it's paid staff or lay leaders. Yeah, good. Great. So, Ray, thank you for that summary. That is a very good book and very informative, just how these different boards have um, matriculated throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah. I want to pivot to Larry in a moment, but before we, I want, we got a good question here, and it just I want this to be thrown out to our panelists here. Comment on, on how the size of the church changes the role of the board. I'd just love for you guys in real time just to weigh in on what you think about that. I guess I think of more principles. If you have the right healthy board, that board can handle any size of a need. If it's a wrong board, I don't care if it what the size is, it's going to be chaos for the pastor. And I think in most good boards, we're trying to go on mission. And if the lead pastor is there to lead you on mission, then we need to remove barriers to keep the church from doing its objectives. I think many times boards no matter the size of the church to constrict the growth or the direction by their power 100 I, I think that's a real problem i don't know if jim's good in, might be somebody else i think practically i agree 100 the 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 uh i think the accountable leadership model which we're going to talk about uh in a few moments it scales it, it'll work great in a church of 50 75 it works in a mega church of 10,000. A management style board, though, is very, very common in small, smaller churches. Uh, you generally peak out at about 150 to 300 people because it gets too big. There's too many moving parts. You get more staff members and the board becomes so cumbersome. It's very hard for a church to grow beyond that size with a management style board. Um, review boards generally occur when a congregation tries to move out of the um out of the management model and before they can step into the next model and it's you know a progression but if you stay with the 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 review board mentality where you're you know empowering but you're always second guessing that tends to allow you to get a little bit bigger but at some point you cap out as well um so yeah, and yeah. I, would, I would add something to add what jim is saying there as the church grows in size the complexity and the relationships between the church staff and the ministry leaders um, become somewhat difficult to uh, define unless it's already set up in the ALM model, which it is. Uh, so, but you have to you have to work on cohesiveness as the church grows. I agree. I love that uh, about the complexity. The other word I would add. Uh, you know, to that, Ray, is speed. As yes. a church gets larger, things move quicker. You have to make quicker decisions and you have different departments that are maybe one department's, may, you know, the children's ministry is dealing with an issue and the youth ministry is dealing with a different issue and and it, it becomes so complex and you have to be able to make quicker decisions, which is why the ALM model becomes so very, very empowering and very important. 
Good. So we've had some general principles. Thank you, uh, Jim, just for sort of those five different board structures that you've seen. And Ray, you shared some material from the book of the council, which has those uh, four different boards throughout history. I want to pivot quickly now and, and zero in to Larry, because you, about 20 years ago, uh, you and your church faced a crisis. You called a new pastor, and then you were tasked to find a board solution that would address the crisis. And that led you to this whole governance search. We got to find a new model. So could you unpack what happened, how that was resolved, you know, and bring it home in the sense of this is a real story. And then we'll get to some more of the principles as we go along. Well, this is, I'll tell you which church it was and what's happened. I think it's good for that. This is Judson Church in San Bernardino. I was heading up the search committee 20 years ago for a new pastor. And this was when uh, the book, uh, winning on purpose was big and we wanted a church on purpose and we had no nobody read the book but it sure sounded good so we were <laughs> all into that idea of we want a church a pastor that leads and so we found a pastor that agreed to come and lead us into mission i never ever occurred to me that the diaconate was going to stop all of his vision and mission growth and i turned him over he was accepted he was there six months the diaconate leaders got with him and said you're not doing it right we don't like you're doing it this way you're out of control this way and he gave his resignation that night six months into his uh tenure and then i got a call about 10 o'clock that night after it was all over and they said we kind of made a mistake down here and we don't know what to do and uh i was stuck with do i either start a new search and come to grips with the reality that we'd lost our pastor after six months, or do we figure out what went wrong on our side in the governance and fix that? And so I tackled that part of it, and that's where I tripped across a guy named John Carver who wrote a book called Boards That Make a Difference. He's an academic out of the East Coast. This is a book you never need to read. It's the most academically tuned book. It's more complex than reading the Apostle Paul. And it's Boards That Make a Difference was the foundation of him doing analysis of boards that were in chaos and how do you get any board healthy hmm. in the private or the or in the profit nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. So I started looking for answers because I had to find an answer and I had six months. He was gracious enough to say, I'll stick with you for a year, but I'm leaving because this is not where we're going. We were able to figure out the model. I jump, jump started that process and he stayed 19 years as a result of us switching from a diaconate sick model to a model where he could lead with some divisionary aspect and we changed the board from a management board to a governance board. Amen. That's very critical to this process. So my experience was I almost lost a lost the whole thing because we had the wrong governance format. And so I'm I'm that's how I got into this in the first place with transformation ministries. This is all I do with you guys in terms of helping is I want to help churches navigate the process that takes you out of chaos into health. And uh, it's only about boards. I'm not trying to help you with your searches and a lot of other things that go on in a church world. But I think this is so foundational and so critical that if we don't get this fixed, you're not going to see growth in the church. Hmm. But that's what happened to me back there, Kirk. It was a crisis that uh, we solved by dealing with it. What we actually did, uh, and I would say this book here that I've got in front of me, Winning on Purpose by John Kaiser. This, yeah. this book was written about a decade or so ago, I think. Mm -hmm. But I was introduced to John Kaiser's concepts here 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. I had one PowerPoint, and I started using that PowerPoint to figure it out. And we started implementing the accountable leadership model off of John Kaiser's observations. John had been reading John Carver's book, which is the one you don't need to ever read. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he has started adapting it and bringing it into the church world and that's what you'll get here so if you're serious about making change this becomes a go-to book from day one if you fully understand this you don't need a coaching and help and mentoring but i find that most churches need to have this book and a little bit of coaching and mentoring to pull this off in a pretty rapid pace of a year or two processing from the time you start but that's where it was all about uh, winning on purpose that's what i i really want to help people get into because it will make a life-changing difference for them 
So you yeah, went from I, a crisis to now being the expert in that very area. So I love by that. By default, this is never right? so And you are problem. the consultant on our team. So uh, Larry, would you just go over kind of the accountable leadership model, just some of the basic, you know, fly over, but give us some of the principles. Like, what are we um, dealing with here? What's the One key about? principle that you'll keep in mind here, and I'll, I say it many times if I'm working with you, if it's not in writing, it does not exist. And most churches have loose things. They think they said something 10 years ago. Somebody's mm -hmm. opinion was a shared 10 years ago. Nobody can find it, but that becomes tradition and law. This is a process that says if it's not in writing, it does not exist. Another thing it does is it moves a church to governance. And governance means you're looking at the big picture. You're looking at where the church is going. You are not looking at how it's managed. Mm -hmm. Now, the management is important, and I'll take you how that fits into the picture. But governance is making sure that you're on the right track and you're doing your right thing. It's not about who's going to turn on the lights next Sunday night after we do X or who's going to take right. care of security. The accountable leadership model is built around a number of things. Number one, a pastor that actually leads. It also is built around a pastor that has a team of people, either full-time or volunteers, that implement the mission. They're the staff, if you want to call them that. They can be volunteers doing jobs, or they can be full-time people doing jobs. That, the, but it's the, it's the facilitators that make things happen. You have a board that's also governing and watching what the pastor's doing, not in a negative way, but in a, in a way of saying, you said you would do it. How do we help you get there? And the question becomes, how do we help us all succeed together? The pastor under the accountable leadership model, after about a year of the honeymoon of this, starts reporting to the board with his plans and specifics each for each of the key, what they call mission principles of the guiding principles. <clears throat> and the accountability is how are you doing in implementing the mission principle plans? Mm -hmm. It's not how you're managing the staff. It's not how you're making decisions on other things. It is about how we're getting the mission done of the church, not how we're implementing the security system of the church. Because the pastor does that kind of work through his staff and through facilitation and other things, but he's held accountable for it. Any board structure of accountability, leadership, the board has one person reporting reporting to them, and that's the senior pastor, or lead pastor. All the other people that he may put underneath him are there to help him manage the process that he's implementing. And the goal here is to help get a church healthy enough that the board is actually engaging in helping the pastor accomplish its objectives. And then they have another tool. There's three tools. There is a Bylaw, the, the, by, the bylaws are critical because it's got to tell you that you can do certain things. We often start by helping rewrite bylaws. If you don't have bylaws correct, you're gonna, you can't pursue because you've got to follow your bylaws. The second tool is what we call guiding principles. In the secular nonprofit world, that's called the board policy manual. It is the one document that speaks to the pastor 24 seven. It speaks to him when the board is not meeting because it outlines what he can do, and in a negative sense, what he cannot do. And if the pastor is following the guiding principles, I've never met a pastor in all my years of working this anxious to play the game outside of the rules. The rules are you know, 12 to 15 pages. It's written in such a way that he can implement those. It is the one piece that keeps on speaking when the board is not meeting face to face. Hmm. And so it's implemented through that. And the pastor that knows what his guiding principles are is playing the game. It's like playing, are you going to play basketball or soccer? They're both sports games with balls, but they're played very differently. And so the rules need to be followed to, to play, to do basketball correctly. And it's different than if you're playing soccer. You don't use your feet in basketball. You use them for a purpose. You, you run with them, but that's about all you do. Right. So that, that's the key part. And then we come along with the third aspect, and that's policies and procedures that help back up the uh, what they call the guiding principles. That's the how-tos of making things work. It's protections that keep you from lawsuits. 
<clears throat> again, if it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. So you need to have things in writing for all of these characters, but much of the in writing for policies and procedures come from the staff side and management. The board is to ensure that they're in place, but not have to write them all. Now there is an element here in the accountable leadership model that you may have a really good board and the people on the board have expertises that the mm -hmm. pastor wants to tap into. He can tap into that expertise, not because they're on the board, but because they have giftings. So it would be very common for me as a chairman of the board to also be reporting to my pastor on implementing things because I was good at it. Yep. So it wasn't a conflict when I was a board member and he was an equal board member, we were working on governance. When I was working on policies and procedures, I was helping him in management, but I was reporting to him. He was not reporting to me. I was wearing a different hat. So even a small group of you know seven to nine people on a board can also use those people in their other expertise ways to pull off things. But what we're trying to do is help a church restructure themselves to where the board can manage or can govern, the pastor can lead, the staff can manage, the membership is the ones that are having fun doing ministry. And so we make it work in such a way that the ministry side is going on by the, the manpower that makes up the staff or the associates, the acting participants or whatever it is. But it is a refreshing thing to no longer see a board politically polarized because most boards end up being politically polarized by strong voices and strong opinions. Last week, I was with a pastor, a, a, a transitional pastor and a, a board chairman, and he agreed 100% that we needed to activate the accountable leadership model. They had been making, they made good steps a decade ago, but they had never really utilized it. But in a matter of 15 minutes, that was shut down by a vocal person in the meeting that felt like it could wait until the new pastor of that church was chosen. That's chaos because you don't want the new guy to come in and start doing politic and shoving of garbage out of the trunk of the car. Yep. We need to help get those things yep. fixed. And But the environment of the accountable leadership model, here was something that was kind of interesting that happened in my experience. I was asked to chair the board when we first started the accountable leadership model. But my wife then reminded me, Larry, you promised me you would never ever serve on another church board. So I said to her, let's try it one year. And if it's not working like I think it could work in a healthy cultural environment, then we'll leave the church and we will let them go back to their old way of doing things. 17 years later, I was still chairing the board of the church. It was fun. It was energizing. It was rewarding. We were in concert. We were working together. It was a healthy growth period. And we never had controversy. That doesn't mean we didn't have good discussions. But it was an environment where we could help make things work because we were helping the mission succeed by governing the direction, not by managing the direction. So there's your pieces, bylaws, guiding principles, and then we have policies and procedures. What we often do with churches in this environment is we walk alongside of them. I tell most people that this is not an event, this is a process. So if I'm committed to helping a church, I say I'm committed to you for about two years. What I mean by that is I'm gonna stick with you until the training wheels are off the bicycle. If the training wheels are off the bike and you can ride the bike well, you do not need any more help. But transitioning from management to governance is a challenge. Learning how to get documents in place is a challenge. And we're here to help churches do that. And it often takes about two years. But it's a series of events. I've got one church in Southern California right now. Next week, they're going to, or tomorrow, tonight, they're pr proposing the new bylaws to the board. They want to get them approved before the end of December. The bylaws only give them permission to have the uh, guiding principles. The guiding principles belong to the board. They don't belong to the membership. So it's once we get the bylaws in place and voted on by the membership, now we're free to do guiding principles. We're free to delegate responsibility of policies and procedures. 
But those three things stand together, the policies and procedures, the guiding principles and the bylaws. And once we get those working, then it's the coaching and the mentoring over a period of time that says, I'm catching on to how this works. I'm reading uh, Winning on Purpose. I understand what he meant in that chapter about X, Y, Z. And by the time a two-year period is up, you not only have got a healthy board, you don't need Bray Bennett or Larry O'Neill or anybody else to help you because you're on your feet. And now you've got a good experience of health rather than a bad experience of management. So that's the real essence of what the whole thing is about. And it takes a little bit of time to do it, but it takes a commitment from day one that we're gonna go this way, but we even help you process how you take a church through the change. A brand new church with young adults or it's gonna go faster than an older one with a lot of tradition. For some reason, many people see that the bylaws of the church, for instance, are more holy than the Bible. And they're afraid to change it. They're afraid to make change it. They're afraid to touch it. A younger generation wants to get it done in two or three weeks. They can understand where this is going and they wanna get back on mission. So you may have some tensions within a church structure by how old it is, how long it takes but there is a way to move that to where it's healthy. And I've seen that probably 25 churches transition out of their old sick way of doing things into a healthy model like this in the last number of years. It's been really fun. So Larry, could I summarize what I heard? Then I'm gonna to turn to Jim because I know you had a question or a comment there. So again, the board is doing policy and vision and that's, and together the pastor is agreeing, this is where we're going with the board. The pastor then becomes the leader and the staff and, and the people do the ministry and it, and it streamlines everything. It streamlines everything. And the governance side is not that they have to write those policies and procedures, but they are ensuring that they exist. For instance, you may say, well, we have a policy and procedure about how we deal with children and our minors. Well, that doesn't mean that the board's got to write those procedures. It probably means that the person in charge of children's got to make sure they're there. But the board wants to make sure they're not going to get sued for something that was failure of not being in writing and thus not existing. The idea is, well, we just followed the state law, whatever it is. Well, boy, you are in trouble in the state of California. <laughs> right. uh, you've got to know what they are and you've got to be diligent in supporting the law. That's not the governance side, that's implementation, but the board wants to say, is that in place and does that exist? And so the, the board is ensuring protection and it's ensuring that you're staying on mission and you are staying out of the way of management Love for it. the most part. Jim, you had a comment and I know there's a couple yeah. of good questions that are surfacing. Some of you who have been uh, discussing this, would you please uh, pay attention to those and see if we can answer a few questions along the way? Go Jim. Yeah, I had two two comments. First of all, I just want to talk to the pastors, those of you that are pastors that are watching this. When when you go through this and what we're covering, we, we listen, I think all three, Larry, Ray, myself, we could talk an all hour by ourselves about this. There's so much that we've experienced, so much we would love to share. We're cramming a lot into a little bit. And my experience is sometimes pastors, when you start talking about policies and procedures and bylaws and all these different things, it gets a little overwhelming, like all this stuff. I just want to encourage you. It is overwhelming at first, but when you go through, it is a process you go through and, and over time it comes together. And when the, and when it begins to come together, it's a beautiful, powerful thing, but don't be overwhelmed and shut down because it's like, this is just so much I have to do. Um, so just keep that in mind. The second thing is, is that if you have a board, this is so important. If you have a board that tends to lean more towards management or permission giving, part of the reason they do that is because we don't tell them what they should do. And part of the beauty of the uh, the accountability leadership model is, is that even though it's a bit overwhelming, as Larry said, it's a two-year process, you're giving your board something to focus their attention on. And when they're proactively working on direction and gui guidance and redoing the bylaws and these procedure stuff, what happens is when you're channeling their attention, they're not as prone to want to, 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 to mingle in the details and manage the church. And, and so often pastors, we don't give our board, we don't proactively direct their attention to do something. So they by default go back to management or to sort of reviewing, second guessing everything. Well, that's a good word. It was a great question that popped up. I'd love just to hear your responses. Any of you guys, um, somebody well, asked, I'm interested question. in what's, so go ahead, Larry. Yeah, there was one question I see came up, come up here. 
uh, what we've done at Transformation Ministries, if you decide to go down this road, uh, you're assigned a coach and a mentor. There's a couple of us out there. Ray does some, I do some. We've got another guy, Rick, down in San Diego is doing others with us. And so we work with you. We're kind of your buddies. But one thing we've done, and Ray and I worked on this about five years ago, is we developed templates that you can use for all of the documents that you need to make this happen. When I was first helping churches, I would tell them, here's what we did at our church, and good luck, and I'm going back to church. What we discovered is that sometimes it was so overwhelming to think they had to restructure. So we've come up with in complete templates of bylaws, complete templates for guiding principles, complete templates for a lot of the policies and procedures. If you don't have them, we'll give them. In Transformation Ministries, we share a lot. I've got documents from every church and all their policies and procedures that I've worked with. And there's some good stuff in there and it's all for free. It comes with the package. When you're needing X, we help you with X. So don't let the overwhelming new idea stop you because a, I was with a church a, a month ago, gave them the documents and three weeks later, they had completed all of their documents for bylaws and guiding principles. I thought that they would be dragging their feet. The secret sauce there is that they were under 35 <laughs> and they were wanting to get on mission. Yeah. Their problem at that church right now is they got to convince four other people that are over 60 that it's a good idea to move this quick yeah. because they're afraid of what it may mean to everything else because their old way of doing things is sacred. Yeah. But we will help you with that kind of stuff. It comes with the package. It comes with helping you know how to market this to your people. We talk about why you've got to have certain place things in place if you don't have a HR manual, we will give you a template, a 48 page template of the HR manual. That's policies and procedures. And it's all compliant with the state of California. If you're outside of California, you've got to take another look at you know, what your laws are. But there are tools available in the process to make this easier. The number one thing you've got to do is decide you're going this way. And that's kind of a formal decision of the board that we will pursue the accountable leadership model. And when we do that, we're going to start the journey of driving there. And it may take us a little while to get there, but it's different driving to Dallas from Southern California than to, to uh, Salt Lake or Seattle. They're two different directions. You're deciding on the direction and then you pack to the direction that you're going. Yes. So we'll help you get all those kind of things. I saw another question about the pastor. The pastor mm -hmm. is an equal part of the governing board. He is not a one that reports just to them, although he has to report. It's accountability to the pastor, but he's an equal part of that. And we coach the pastor on how he works with the accountable leadership model. It's new to him. A lot of this is new because we've just never done it before. It's not difficult. It's just different. Yes. When Larry says he's, he's equal, that means he has a vote. Yes, the, the pastor has a vote. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just wanted to, just, just a quickie on an implementation. I uh, coached a, a church that had years and years of splits and years and years of discarding pastors. And uh, with a new pastor, and we talked about the ALM model, and we, we coached him through it. And what they did, just this is I'm talking to pastors now thinking that this is too big a task and they've already got a busy board. They set up an ad hoc committee and they made sure uh, that they had some good talents on that board, uh, that, that ad hoc board for drafting up some of the things uh, like their guiding principles and so on. This is before some of the templates were available. And I insisted when I met with that ad hoc board that they have a membership of the leadership board attend so that when they were finished, they had the leadership board well aware of what had happened. Well, I stayed with them and uh, a, few, a few months later, we were now having a vote in front of this whole church congregation to adopt the ALM. And this church, as I said, had been split many, many times. They had a 100% vote. A little bit later, I was with the pastor because I followed up and I said, uh, what's going on? And he said, Ray, I, I got to tell you this. He said, we had, a, we had a church that we rented some space to, but they weren't doing too well. They wanted to merge with us. And he said, under the, prior to the ALM model, he said, I could never have made that happen. 
under the ALM, there was enough trust, there was enough work brought in and built up amongst the team that the church accepted the other church into this church and absorbed it and gave them uh, board membership. So it's, mm. it's a great way of um, building trust within the team. And as Larry said, it's fun when it's working. I also suggest to make things work like that, that socialize with your board, take them outside of the church room, go <clears> somewhere <throat> for a weekend, talk about what you're doing, build a rapport, have a little fun. I'd like to do this. Uh, another question was asked by uh, David about, so coaching mentoring happens with all the board members to help them uh, work within the model. 100%, absolutely. One of the principles in AELM is this, as a board, we speak with one voice or no voice. There are no individuals in an AELM model as far as people trying to run, make decisions. You try to build this cohesiveness to where we say we have our individual voices and we debate and we discuss inside. But when we go out to the congregation, we speak with one voice. Yeah, and so you, you have to bring all of your board together to go through this, because if you have one person or two people who don't buy in, it doesn't matter how far you are into the process of the pastor or other board members are bought in. You have to get everybody into it. And that also to, uh, to raise point, it builds a trust when people see the board unified. It, it, it builds trust the congregation. Furthermore, the opposite is true. If you are cracked at the top, you are always split at the bottom. Absolutely. If your board is cracked a little bit, it, it, that split magnifies as it goes through the church. And, uh, and so you have to take your whole board through the process to try to get this, uh, this implemented. And as the board buys in, and, and the other thing about, I would say, it's very important from a pastoral perspective, when you get Larry or someone to come alongside you to help mentor you through this process, Larry's voice carries much more weight than my voice as the pastor. When they hear it from me, some people are like, well, what's your really agenda here? What are you trying to do here? But when they hear someone from the outside come in and say, listen, let me give you examples and models, and they bring that experience, that mentoring process that TM offers you, I just cannot tell you how valuable that is to implement the process. It's not all on you. Right. Yeah, we'll help you get there. Well, that's what our whole goal is. When I came to my church in Orange County over 25 years ago, we had six different boards. I had staff reporting to different boards. It was as chaotic and crazy making as it gets. And over the years, we worked our way down to finally having the a rudimentary ALM model. There was trust, there was health, there was focus, there was vision, there was permission uh, in the sense of we're accountable to one and love one another. And we were really clear to listen to God and go forward. It was so fun towards the end. I love that. So I, I've lived into that and I have suffered the other side of it deeply. So really, really appreciate you gentlemen, what you've said. So if we're going to get a church started, what's, what's, what are the first steps? How does it go? Well, I would, my first step is make sure you get copies today, ordered on Amazon, winning on purpose. Thank yes. You. Everybody on the board will need the book, but right now, probably it's an executive pastor or a lead person or a person that knows you're in trouble. Uh, probably two or three copies, but when you're finished, you'll have everybody reading it because it's important to get them all into it. The secondly is make an agreement between a few people that you're going to start going this way and bring us in. It's a lot easier. And, and two, I mean, Ray's in the pastoral side of things, but two of us in this mix are lay people and we've been on boards for a long time. And it's amazing how board to board discussions are an advantage when it comes to pastor relationships because you're talking to somebody just like them and you're getting coached by people that are just like them. And then, and then the process begins and we will start helping you look at your bylaws and we'll start helping you transition that and figure out the schedule, the calendar. It's a process. The first thing, though, you need to do, if this is of interest, is contact the TM Church Health Office. Let them know who you are, what church you're in, phone number, email address, and so forth. They will get that out to one of us to, to deal in this subject. And we'll follow up with you and have a conversation with you about what you're facing. And there may then be very likely a need to come together one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. Last week I was with the church and spent three hours with just the chairman and uh, the associate, the person that the pastor staff. And that's all we dealt with. I know 
there's other meetings that have got to occur, but we need to figure out the roadmap before <laughs> we decide which, you know, where we're going. And then we start working on the process together. It is a steps and stages in growth and advancement. It's not going to happen overnight, but I would say that most churches within three months to a year can be operating very easy this way. And that includes probably getting a membership, if you're a membership driven church, to vote for a new bylaws that'll give permission for the rest of the board to function in governance. Many times the old format tells you that you've got to have a diaconate, it's got to do certain things. It tells you so restrictive what you've got to do. We will help them with the documentation, but also help you land on a win-win situation. But it starts with a phone call, but please go out and get a copy. If you've never seen it before, Winning on Purpose by John Kaiser is your primer, is your, is your books. Yeah, it's your primer yep. to get to where you want to be here. So this is the key piece. And then once you've got this, as we start interacting, you'll say, oh, that makes more sense because you just said it in a different way and you illustrated it. This is going to be key to where you're going in the long run. I would add one more thing, and that is this uh, particular webinar is focused on governance. But when you call the TM office, if you have other problems with your church, uh, ask for Peter Torrey's uh, number. Uh, Peter runs the, uh, along with Kurt, runs the uh, chat team, the church health advocacy team. And we, Larry and I are part of that. This is one segment of it, but there are many, many other services that are offered by TM. So I encourage you to make that call. Yeah, that's great. So Ray and Larry, and I know Jim had to take off. Thank you guys for your contribution. You guys have lived this. You are, you are um, really invested in this and have seen this um, go in a really good direction. Would, Ray, would you pray us out as we end today? Father, we pray for the, all of your churches. So many are having difficulty today with the uh, change changes that are going on. Uh, the competition for time with people. Father, we pray for a re-anointing of each, each pastor that steps into the pulpit on Sunday morning or at any time to guide and direct people within his parsonage. Hmm. We pray, Father, for each and every congregation that they will come to understand that God is in control. He is always the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He brings hope for those that are depressed. He brings hope for those that are in difficulties. He brings hope for those that want a new and better life. And it's called his church. It's called his gospel. And I ask that, Father, that we're empowered with the right words to get that message across each and every day of our lives, whether we're in church or walking down the street. Put people in our path that need to be talked to, that need to have some guidance, that need to have some love for the moment and encouragement. Mm -hmm. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. 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 Thank you all for participating. We hope this has been helpful. We'd love to talk to you further privately if we can help. So Lord bless you and uh, go in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you, guys.